All right, well, we're here at the Patterns and Practices Lab that's newly remodeled. We're here with Ed and Peter. You guys want to go ahead and introduce yourselves? Hello, I'm Ed Rodzierski. I'm architect of Patterns and Practices, and uh, here is Peter. My name is Peter Provost. I manage the development team here at PNP. And what, what, do you, what does Patterns and Practices do? Um, Patterns and Practices creates uh, different types of assets, guidance, to code, tools, extensions, anything that might help our customers build applications on the .NET platform. So if you reusable components, if you need tools, if you need some written guidance on how to secure a website, um, we try to capture the best practices from the field and give it back to you in a way that is easy to use in your own projects. Great, great. And that's all downloadable on MSDN, right? Yep, it's all for free. It's all with code, source code with all the unit tests. Great. So well, goodness. Sounds good. Well, we're here today to, to uh, take a walk around the new lab that you guys have. Can you uh, give us the tour here and tell us a little bit about how you got this new lab? Sure, well, let's start with the how, because I think it's better to kind of tell people how we ended fun. up with this thing. Yeah. Um, we are a very much of an agile software development shop. We've been doing extreme programming and, uh, and agile techniques for quite some time. And uh, it started off that, that our team members wanted to work together. And so they started off by stealing a conference room. Uh, space is very hard to come by at Microsoft, and the conference room was about the only thing they could do. Uh, there came a point when the admin said, no more, you can't do that. Yeah, and sorry to all the lies to the receptionist. Yes, yes, no. Uh, um, we, we lied to them and we, and we stole conference rooms, but they said, no, you can't do that anymore, and they took it away. And, and we progressively escalated until we could get a conference room that was totally ours for this one project. Then we, uh, we, we kind of continued to escalate bigger and bigger, and, and finally we got the attention of the local Microsoft facilities team uh, who heard about the way we want it worked and were interested in exploring it at a higher level and seeing if this could be something that the rest of Microsoft be interested in. And uh, so then we moved out of the space for, what, three months or so? Yes, while they into a cave. Went into a cave while they ripped this place back to steel and concrete and then built what we're about to show you. So let's, uh, let's start walking through here. Sounds good. Yep. What you're seeing here on the left-hand side are our team rooms. In each one of these team rooms uh, is, is a focused group of people who are working together on a project. Um, so you'll find it's, it's a cross-functional team. You'll find architects, uh, product managers, program managers, developers, testers, all working together. You'll see that lots of whiteboard space, lots of collaborative tooling. So there's projectors overhead. Um, all of the cabling and wiring is run through the floor so that all the teams have a lot of, uh, have the ability to reconfigure the space as needed. Flat screen monitors, dual monitors, um, overhead projectors, speakers. You'll even hear a little bit of music in this one. Um, to really let the team behave like a team, to let the teams uh, really maximize their collaborative potential. Yeah. One important thing about how we got to these designs and how we got to the furniture, etc., is that it was a very collaborative uh, process for the people who designed the space around here. They came to us, they studied us as um, ethnographers sitting with us, seeing how we work. We talked to them about our preferences, about what we wanted to do, and it uh, affected even little details that may be not noticeable to the common eye. For example, it's very common for desks for developers to be round usually because it gives them maximum desk space at reach. Here we preferred flat desks because they would allow pairing and sliding chairs back and forth, sharing the keyboard between two developers. Um, we have uh, some projectors that help us for impromptu code reviews and to put things on the screen and discuss them as a team uh, without too much ceremony or having to book some other spot. And uh, we have walls that can move actually. We could, in 10 minutes, slide a wall in here, remove this wall behind you and uh, essentially reconfigure the space to the current needs of the team and not let the space be a thing that helps us anchor us back in the way we do things, but rather be dynamic, change, and have the space change with us. And as you see, these aren't just walls. These walls are actually two pieces of glass with a piece of white film sandwiched between them so that they double as whiteboards. And our teams use these as you know eight-foot-tall whiteboards. And you can see they get written on, on both sides. And, uh, and, and allow us to, to, to really have as much collaborative working space as we possibly can. Around the outside of these team rooms are offices. And uh, some of the offices are different sizes. You can see this office here is a double size office that gets shared by three different people who again are working together collaboratively to get their job done. So they decided that being in individual offices wasn't a value add for them. So they decided to put together a teaming space. Different people have different needs. Managers, of course, have a legitimate need for, for individual offices so they can meet with their people and do reviews and have some of those harder conversations. Um, let's go to the escape pod. Yes, we also have these escape <laughs> pods. Let's go ahead and take a peek in here. You see the lights turn on automatically when you walk in. All of our spaces are, are I've got climate, uh, localized climate control and, uh, and power settings so that when you move in and start using a space, 
uh, it actually, uh, it, the lights come on and the lights go off, so it helps us work right. that way. And since we, a lot of us are working in the common shared rooms, this allows us to step out, have a phone conversation, and have an impromptu like meeting, <laughs> like right now, like that right now. Um, where we can just go and have a little private set without disturbing the rest of the team. If you go ahead and peek through this door, we don't want to go in and disturb this team. You can see here's a room that's a different size with a completely different floor layout. These guys have reconfigured for, for their needs, and in fact, there's, they're going to be reconfiguring again next week, but this is a, a larger room for a different size team. Uh, again, whiteboards all the way around, completely reconfigurable as the team's needs change. And how often is that? How often do you actually move the, the, the walls around so that you can reconfigure a workspace? We don't move the walls very often. The teams have a tendency to move uh, roughly quarterly. It, it seems that, months, it seems, months, it yeah. seems that, uh, that the team's sizes go through kind of a variable period where they start off small, ramp up, and hit that middle stage. And as they do that, they'll move from some of the smaller rooms at that end of the space up towards these, these bigger ones. And as the bigger teams finish their projects and start to ramp down, they might move back towards the smaller rooms. So we find that about quarterly, we have to kind of reassess our needs and move some of the teams around. Three of these teams did a rotation yesterday yep. based on needs. One of the big teams had actually shrunk, and one of the smaller teams had grown, and we had to address that. And we just did it very flexibly, a quick meeting. Everybody agrees. Because the spaces are all the same, we can just move and be done. That's great. Now, what about who gets these outside offices here? How, how do you decide you know, who gets their own office versus who's in the shared workspace area? Well, everybody has an office they can go to, uh, an office they can go to to get away from the team space. Some people have an office that is theirs exclusively because their job kind of requires that they have that, that sense of separation. So technical writers often have that. Managers often have that. Um, sometimes project managers who are coordinating multiple different projects have to have that kind of thing, uh, especially as they deal with more offshore work. Um, but some people have shared offices, as I showed you the double down there, and you'll see a couple more shared offices as we come up this way, because those people tend actually to spend most of their time working in the team room, and, there's, and, and it would be you know, wasteful to have a dedicated empty office sitting there for them. So Correct. As an architect, I chose to have a shared office with the other, a couple of other architects. So there's every, at all times, there's somebody occupying it, and then we can always move out and work with a team, and I actually tend to sit down with a team, working on the project, sitting with the devs and the testers and so on, but every once in a while, we want to go and do an architect geek fest in there, and then we just start drawing lines and circles on the, on the boards. Um, so this corner yeah. space is the one Ed was just talking about, and on plan, this is two offices that has had the wall taken down between them, and three architects live in here and work together. The interesting thing is that these walls on these outer offices are actually modular and can be removed without requiring city permits. So we can make a quick facilities request and can get these walls taken down, and we can turn double offices into singles, singles into doubles, and it gives us a lot of more flexibility that way. That's great. I really like the sense of openness too. Even if you are in one of these shared workspaces, you know you can you can easily look outside and see our rainy Seattle weather, and you know it's 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 really nice to uh, bring a lot of the natural light in here too. Yeah, what, actually that was important part of the whole uh, process. We wanted somehow to make a space that reflected the you know, touchy feely core values we have around here. Mm -hmm. Things like openness. You can see everything. We have nothing to hide. You know, you have you're in an office and there's all glass around you. The engineering teams are in the center, and everybody can look into uh, them through the, all this glass and all these windows, and um, that conveys a sense that as an engineer, as a developer, you're giving your stuff to the outside world. The outside world has a right to look into you, and you almost want to be, you know, good at what you do because you know that people are watching, and we want that is almost reflected in the space in kind of an uncanny way. Another important aspect is having space and time to talk with your customers, which is kind of a core fundamental thing of any Agile stuff. So we actually thought we should have a room for meeting with customers, where we actually try to have customers and field people come in, work with us as we're building our assets. They're building their things, we're building ours, and we're working together, making sure that what we build and what we recommend is useful and usable by them. And uh, anybody who is in here can maybe use a room, but if you're coming with a customer, you can preempt and kick them out. And uh, that is part of the prioritization. We want to be inerrant in every day behavior. And what do customers say about the lab? Are, are you finding a lot of other customers that have done similar projects back in their development rooms as well? Uh, well, what's it's very interesting is as customers come through and visit with us and spend time with us, um, we find they're very influenced by a lot of our behaviors. <laughs> um, so we, we often end up spending a fair amount of our time talking with them not just about uh, the guidance that we deliver, uh, and, and the products we produce, but also about the way we do our work, the way we do our agile software development, um, and, and these spaces. So, um, you know, when Ed and I are out talking at conferences, we often have to spend a, a certain amount of time showing the space and talking about it. 
And then we find that a lot of them go back to their own homes and want to do this. I had a meeting with a, with a company just a few weeks ago, and they specifically asked to come in, not to talk about PNP, not to talk about Visual Studio, not to talk about any of that. They wanted to see the space, and they wanted to learn how we worked and lived in this space because they wanted to do it themselves. It's really an interesting experience. Right, especially as we start sharing more and more about the software we've built, the quality of it, and the timing. Um, if you look at a typical six to nine month project, right now we consider it almost disastrous if we have to slip by a week or something which is a uh, precision in the ability to make estimates of when your project will be done and the time we ship that is not found in most software projects. And this is because we use Agile, we use a constant reprioritization of what not to do so that we can meet those dates. But when customers come and talk to us, they realize flat screens don't help you deliver more, more customer value and projectors don't help you have a better scheduling of your software projects. It is really about the culture, the way people talk together, the way testers and developers intermingle across the duration of the project, the way you can bring customers in. And that is where they see the impact in their own projects uh, via potential because they want to replicate that behavior. Have your team work together, work your, with your customers and engineering teams together to achieve those results. That's great. So what kind of suggestions do you have for other teams who may not have the uh, you know, pilot program budget that you did when you were de developing these, these labs? Are there, are there tips or techniques that you could share for, for teams that kind of want to you know, be more agile but on a budget? Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, the, the first thing is, is, um, is to start thinking about how you can get people to work closer together. And you can do it the way we did it. And I would suggest that that's a great way yeah. to start. Steal a conference room. Get people out of their offices. If you're in, uh, if you're in a cubicle environment, turn the cubicles around so that the walls are on the outside and people are in together. Put the cubicles around the ring in the outside. I've seen a lot of people explore those kinds of things that, that change the culture. As Ed said, it's about, it's about the culture and it's about the feel of the team as they work together and more than it is about you know, having a million dollars to spend to build something like this. We were, able, we were lucky to be able to do this yes. so that we can get five or six teams running with that culture and affect the culture of our entire uh, group. Um, but you can produce that culture by just letting people get together and by encouraging them to sit together and by getting out of the offices and getting out of the cubes. Right. Simple things, you know, posters on the walls saying what are the things that are important for the team. People being able to share what they're doing um, the ability to have a daily little stand-up, five-minute calls, everybody just quips out what they're working on, and uh, bringing the customer in and checkpointing with them more often are very simple things that anybody can do, but it drastically changes the result and also the satisfaction of the people working on it. And the other thing that's really interesting that uh, you haven't asked about yet, but I'll go ahead and jump in with, um, is the influence that this is having around the rest of the company. Uh, we are part of Visual Studio Team System, and um, there are the other sister organizations to us inside of the family come by and visit us quite a bit and, and are very intrigued by what we're doing and we're starting to see more and more interest in, in exploring uh, these kinds of approaches to the way they build software on the other projects inside of the family and it's, uh, it's been a lot of fun for us and we actually have some commitments this year to help them achieve those goals. It's going to be a fun year. That's great. Yeah, I think I think a lot of the customers that I talk to, they're they're pretty shocked actually when they hear that Microsoft is truly embracing this agile development methodology. It's 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 a uh, it's just happening across the company. It's fantastic. I mean, the the database professionals team as part of Team System, they're they're scrumming to build their product, and I think that's really exciting. It it really represents a a neat shift in culture. Yeah, we're finding a very high adoption uh, inside of developer division uh, in particular, and the rest of the company of uh, Scrum, of test-driven development, iterative development, even when they're not doing one of the formal processes, um, uh, prioritized iterative planning. These are the things, these are the key, uh, the, bent, the cornerstones of Agile. And, uh, and these are the things that are really helping these teams change the way they build software and produce more frequently, better quality, and it's, it's, it's going to be a great, uh, a great couple of years as we start to make these changes. And Absolutely. really better for our customers too, right? Absolutely. Yes. Yep. And uh, the more we do it, the better the tools we'll get, and the more customers will be able to do it in turn. So we want that to keep snowballing. So if you're on the outside as a customer or if you're on the inside of Microsoft and you want to participate or come in, um, it's easy to find us. We have a site, it's microsoft.com slash practices. On our channel, uh, this is very easy to find. And we want to encourage you to come in, um, give us the privilege of spending some time with you. Maybe we, you will take some value and maybe we will learn something about how we can help this agile methodology scale more. It's great. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Ed. Thank you this very much. This has been a uh, really great, great tour. I think I'd like to just close with a one piece of culture that uh, we picked up from the walls over here. Don't feed the developers. You can feed the testers, but they only eat bugs.
All right. Thanks, guys. Thank you.